looking for Bigfoot in the woods is like trying to win the lottery, I think. Mere chance might bump you into one. I'm not a great talker, by the way. I like to talk for short periods of time and then open up to questions. So if you have any questions, subscribing and leaving comments. Idaho. In my opinion, it doesn't go beyond that. 
When I was doing my book um, in the 70s, I did uh, 10 years of research. And each year I worked for about nine months of the year. And that was a lot of time. And when I heard of stories of sightings or footprint finds in places like Florida and Michigan, Illinois, I went to those states and talked to the people and investigated them. I found nothing credible out there at all, nothing. I could have been wrong. Maybe there is something out there. But as far as I'm concerned now, it's in the Northwest here. And of course, that's very convenient to all of us because we live here. I've just started a new project. I've been out of it for 10 years. I've been out of it for 12 years, actually. And um, <clears throat> I didn't want to get back into it. I had a number of offers. It always comes down to money. Money buys time. If you've got to work, you can't go looking for Bigfoot other than on weekends. You can find the money, money buys the time. And across the years, I had several offers from the sponsors who said, you know, will you go back into it and do another search? And my answer was no until I got what I wanted. And recently, in August, I got what I wanted, which was a um, fully financed and adequately supported and financed uh, five-year project, which began in August and which is now operating from Parkdale, Oregon, where I live. It's called the Bigfoot Research Project, and um, our plan is to um, try and crack the mystery one way or the other. Um, I left a little flyer down there with Ray's permission, and when you're on the way out, you can pick it up, because it'll explain what the project's all about, and uh, not so much what we're trying to achieve, because what we're trying to achieve is what we're all trying to achieve, to see one, and see what they look like, maybe communicate, and so on, but it'll tell you something about who we are and what we're doing. It's a benign research project, uh, no guns, uh, not anti-gun or anti-hunting, but in this case, I think it would be criminal to shoot one of these things. We don't know how many there are. Years ago, I remember talking with some children, and we were talking about shooting one. And a little boy said to me, he said, uh, supposing the one we shoot is the last one. And that was the point. So um, I have a new project, it's underway, and um, what we're going to try and do is um, gather all of the evidence that's available. The historical stuff, stuff, the footprint finds, sounds, smells, sightings, and um, assess its credibility and then get it into a computer and see what the computer tells us. This is going to take at least a year, maybe as much as two years, before we even go out in the woods to look. It's nice to go out in the woods. I like going out, I like hiking. But looking for Bigfoot in the woods is like trying to win the lottery, I think. Mere chance might bump you into one. I'm not a great talker, by the way. I like to talk for short periods of time and then open up to questions. So if you have any questions, um, please uh, don't hesitate to interrupt me. I speculate, by the way, that, um, and here we go into speculation. You may have the same speculation as me, or yours may be different. That what we're looking at is, is a hominid form of some kind, a human form, hair covered. The fact that it's hair covered doesn't make it um, an ape. We have more hair follicles on our bodies than a gorilla does, just that our hair doesn't grow. It's um, bipedal, walking upright, um, possibly nocturnal, um, probably nomadic. There are some people who say they may stay in areas for a period, of, a certain period of time in certain areas, but I don't know. I think they're nomadic. They're extremely shy. As to being intelligent, again, I don't know. You don't have to be very intelligent to avoid the average man in the woods. People go into the woods and make a lot of noise. They slam car doors, they get out, they shout, they talk. The best sightings of Bigfoot had been by people, by hunters, who'd been sitting quietly waiting for an animal, like in the hunting season, waiting for help, waiting for deer. So you don't have to be terribly intelligent to avoid the average person. So we don't know whether we're dealing with a higher level of intelligence than ordinary animal intelligence. How many people have seen a cougar? A cougar is a very alert, extremely shy animal. I've been here now, in the States, I've been here 20 years, and um, actually living here, I mean, and I've seen one cougar once, that's all. I speculate that they might be omnivorous, eating everything. This is a big creature, and he needs a lot of food. But there's plenty of food out there. In the average of the square mile of the Pacific Northwest, there's supposed to be as much as 100 edible plants. So there's plenty of food. The prime requirements of all wild creatures is their food, water, cover, and space. And these are the requirements of a mouse or the requirements of an elephant. The animal must have water, food, must have cover, must have space. I don't think they're dangerous. There are some stories. Ray and I may have differences on this, but that's all right. It's a free country. We're all entitled to our own religions. 
I don't think they're dangerous. I think that if they were dangerous, there would be a record of that danger. I think children would have been kidnapped. Women might have been abducted. People might have been murdered. I see no record of this at all. If there was a record like this, I think we would know about it. People are lost from time to time. Like young Corey Pay was lost recently. I was up there when they found him. I was up there by accident, actually. And um, he died up there. And um, under odd circumstances, instead of turning around and going back to where he came from, where his pickup was, he turned and walked uphill into the snow. And he walked 10 miles up, up, up. And he got into the snow. And I remember the time he disappeared. It was very cold, windy, wet weather. And so he perished up there. And then he was eaten, probably by bears. All that's found of him was just um, small remains, nothing more. They found his pack and they found his gun. I don't think that has anything to do with the Bigfoot at all. So in the area of violence, I don't think things are violent. I think they're completely non-violent. I don't think anyone has anything to be afraid of in the woods. That's about all I have to say. Questions? Peter, I think the obvious first question is, did you see that Paul Freeman film a, little, a few minutes ago? Yes. What did you think? I would have to study it. I'd have to get a copy and look at it about 50 times. About five years ago, I went to um, Eastern Oregon with um, a crew from um, Current Affair um, to meet Paul Freeman. And we spent a couple of days with him going around. And he showed us several sets of tracks. The tracks he showed me were all faked, every single one of them. I'm not saying he faked them, but they were faked. They were made in pine needles and loam. And uh, the person who made them made them by kicking, like this, kicking, kicking his feet in as he walked along. So instead of a footprint, which you don't get in pine needles, they compress and they spring out again. You've got these great gouges, which are 20, 25 inches long. They were ridiculous. This is what Paul Freeman showed me. Very nice fellow, decent man. <laughs> Probably quite honest, but um, as to his film and his other findings, I don't know. I really don't know. What he showed me was fake. I'm, I'm certain of that. Yes, this is great. I'm quoting now from a Coleman book, or referring to it. 1959, you spent some time in the cave with your brother, you have an answer for me, but the rest of people will be interested, where you spent some time drinking yak milk and cheese. Were you still having yetis at the time, or doing a reconnaissance, or just uh, well, having a good time in the cave? <laughs> you don't have a good time in the cave drinking yak milk. <laughs> a good time in the hotel drinking scotch. <laughs> what hotel? Well, yeah, it was 59. <clears throat> 1959. Now, this is just before you were followed back by Tom Slick. Okay, we had, three, we had three abominable snowman or Yeti expeditions. The first one was in 57, lasted three months. Tom Slick came with us on that. The second one was in 58, lasted seven months. The third one was in 59, lasted nine months. So what you're talking about there was in the third Yeti search uh -huh. in the central Himalaya. You were still actively searching at the time, or were you snowed in in the cave? Or? Can't remember. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Slick thought there were three different types of Yeti that lived over there in uh, Nepal. Uh, do you think those same three types now live in North America? No, I don't think so. I've seen no evidence. No, I think there's one type here. Or shall I say that all I've seen, the evidence I've seen suggests that there's only one type. That's all. Mm -hmm. I'll let somebody else and I'll come back again. Okay. Could you just yeah. touch on the story of the digit that you brought back? Why does everybody keep bringing this story up? Oh, that's fascinating, <laughs> man. We, um, we, we were um, up in the central Nepal, a place called Sola Kambu, and we came into a village, and there was a temple there. And um, the, uh, there were about a dozen uh, Tibetan priests looked after this temple, and they took turns. Each one spent a month looking after the temple while the others rested. And by, by good fortune, the man who was looking out at the temple on this particular, in this particular month was um, um, a Tibetan who had been in the um, Gurkha army with the British years and years before. So he spoke Nepalese, which I speak. I don't speak Tibetan. If, he'd been, if he had only spoken Tibetan, I would not have been able to converse with him. So we, we began to talk to him, and um, he said, have you got any whiskey? We said yes. So we sat down and drank some whiskey. He <laughs> had a great fondness for scotch. He was quite a drinker. And one night we were drinking and he said, um, would you like to see the Yeti hand that's up in the monastery, up in the temple? And we were astounded. He said, of course. So we went up there in the middle of the night and um, climbed up into the second story. And uh, he pulled this thing out of the box and he showed it to us. And I said, um, you know, can I take that? He said, no, if you take that, the temple will fall down and curses will come on the heads of the people and so on. So 
We sent a message back to um, back to London, and at that time, <coughs> the, the, the single scientist who was behind us, his name was Dr. Osmond Hill, and he was the head of the London Zoo. And uh, it took a long time to get a message out, to get a message back. It took about two months. And he sent a letter back and said that if you uh, photograph it, measure it, and he said if you can't um, uh, get the thing, try and get part of it. So uh, we talked with the old man and said, can we chop a piece off? And he said, no, certainly not. So um, that was 58. At the end of the year, we came down. And I flew back to London. And I sat down with Osmond Hill and we talked about this and he said, this is very important. He said, we've got to get it back here and examine it under control conditions. We've got to get it under a microscope and see what it is. So I said, we can't do that. He said, well, I'll tell you what. He said, why don't you steal it and replace it with a human hand? So we're having lunch in the London Zoo. <laughs> we had this beautiful white tablecloth and the silver and the servants and everything else. And I said, where am I going to get a human hand? And he pulls a brown paper sack from out of the table. Drops a human hand on the table and runs. He says, There's a human hand. There's this desiccated, dried up human hand. So we went back there, and this is months later. We climbed all the way up there. We met the Lama. He was still there. And um, I said, um, How about giving me the hand? I'll replace it with this. So eventually we bargained with him. He said, No, take one finger and uh, replace it with a finger from this. So I got into the monastery, into the temple late at night. And it was very spooky because the, um, the top room of the temple was, was circular. And the, the ceiling was about 12 feet high. And the only light was these little yak butter lamps, these glimmering lamps. And all around in, in glass cases are the mummified figures of the head lamas of, of the temple who have died across the years. And they're mummified and in their robes in these glass cases. So I worked up there one, two, three, four in the morning and cut the finger off. and. Um, put the other finger on, wired it on, painted it, put it back in the box, and got out just before dawn. And um, it's, it's, it's amusing to leap ahead. Um, over the years, we see pictures of people examining this hand and looking at the finger and noticing that it's wired on. In fact, even Sir, Ed, Sir Edmund Hillary said, there's something funny about that finger. It's wired on. <laughs> it was the thumb. The next thing was to get the finger out of the country, and um, we got a message from our sponsor, Tom Slick, and he said, um, uh, try and get down to Calcutta. He said, there's Miss and Mrs. Stewart, who will be at the Grand Hotel in Calcutta on such and such a date. So I, I trekked down across the country, it was about a 10 day trek, and then I got on the train, I went down to Calcutta, and I arrived at the hotel, and this was Jimmy Stewart, the actor, and his wife, and I met them. And um, I showed them the thumb and said, um, uh, can you take this back to the States? And they said, certainly, because Tom Slick was a friend of theirs. In fact, they were related in some way. So they took the finger. You see, you can't send something like that through the mail out of India. <laughs> There's no, no UPS, no Federal Express. So um, what was amusing is when they were leaving, they worried about the um, uh, Indian customs a little bit. And they worried about the British customs. So Gloria, who was Jimmy Stewart's wife, thought the one place they never looked would be in my underwear, so she put it in her underwear, in her little underwear case. <laughs> when they got back to London, um, all of their luggage came off, the customs waved it, waved them through, and the underwear case was missing, it disappeared. About two days later, a customs um, official turned up at the Dorchester Hotel with her case, unopened, and said, this was found at the airport, it must be yours. Mm. So we gave the finger to Osmond Hill, and um, stewards came on back to the States, and he looked at it, and um, as far as I remember, he was not able to identify it, and that's all. And Ray was asking me tonight what happened to the finger, and I don't know. He died, and as happens in cases like this, it disappeared. It might be instilled in the box in the London Zoo somewhere. That's the story of the finger. Yes. Um, there was a show on uh, a couple hours before this um, meeting, and um, Ray said that um, there was a bad big
Bigger than a human hand? No, it wasn't. It was about that size of a normal, big human hand. Yours or mine. That's all. And it was, um, he said it was 100 years old. It was black, dry. Skin was all cracked on it. And from the, the oil of the butter lamps in the room up there, it was very, very black and greasy. Um, that's what it was, I don't know. They said it was a Yeti hand. They said someone come from Tibet and given them that and the scalp. There's a scalp in the monastery also. Got some hairs from the scalp later. The scalp is still there. Yes, Ray. Unsolved mysteries, said that you got the Lama or the Dalai Lama drunk. Uh, yes, we did. Yeah. Oh, you did? Oh, okay. you did. Several right. times. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, that's all I wanted. It was clear. Thank you. If you saw an unsolved mystery, they do, um, they do a scene in, uh, on unsolved mysteries where I'm just sitting talking to the Lama. And um, when we decided to do this in February of this year, uh, they didn't want to go to Nepal. So they chose um, um, Mammoth Lake Ski Lodge up in, in California. And so we went down there. And um, we, went, we, we shot most of it at 10,000 feet on the mountain behind Mammoth Lakes. And the wind howled and it snowed. It was colder than the Himalaya. It was awfully cold. It was terribly cold. The cameras were freezing up, but we were freezing up most of the time. So when it came to the scene of me getting the llama drunk, sitting in a little tent, we put the tent in the conference room in the hotel. <laughs> and the two men stand behind the tent holding the canvas, and they shake the canvas like this. And then they put in the sound of the wind howling, and that's how it seems. <laughs>